Uh, it is uh, 8th of September and uh, this year uh, the sixth month on the biblical calendar goes exactly in line with, with September which means it's also the 8th of the sixth month the month of Elul and this was uh, the month on which Moses was called back on the mountain for the second time to receive uh, a new set of um, stone tables with the laws. Um, and that started a new period of 40 days. Uh, again, the Israelites had to wait until Moses would return. Just as the first time, the first time they became impatient and they made this golden calf. And now um, they had uh, learned at least a lesson and they were waiting until he returned. Um, it is traditionally a period of 40 days in the year uh, that are called uh, the, the days of Teshuvah. Teshuvah is the Hebrew word for repentance. And um, it begins on the first of the month, Elul 1, and then it lasts until the 10th of the seventh month, which is the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. So that is what we... we we re remember, especially in this period of the year, it is just a reminder that we reflect on ourselves, uh, that we um, repent from the things that we need to repent from, that we get right with the Lord, so that on the Day of Atonement, we are indeed, um, or our sins are atoned. In between, after 30 days, on the first of uh, Tishri, is then uh, Yom Teruah or Rosh Hashanah. So this is the period we live in. It's after the long summer, uh, yeah, uh, anticipating the fall feasts. Um, so it's all about what is called teshuva uh, or repentance. And uh, in Hebrew, teshuva is from the uh, root word shuv, which means turning back or turning around. Uh, and this word is uh, used... Uh, around a thousand times in scripture so it's it's a, a very important thing it's very often that God calls the Israelites to turn around to repent and of course in the New Testament it's not different we read it all the time and so God is calling us to that um, repeatedly and it's interesting that in these 40 days um, in the, the biblical tradition uh, the shofar the trumpet is blown every day. So every day people are uh, reminded, uh, this wake-up call every day, until uh, Rosh Hashanah, that is when the last trump blows, and then there um, you, you go up to the, to the Day of Atonement. In English, repentance, um, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means uh, having great remorse, great, great regret. And so it goes very well together. Because of this regret, you want to change. You want to change something. And uh, actually, uh, it is said that man's target or man's purpose is the shuva. It's repentance. That's why we are here on this earth. We are born in sin. And therefore, we must be born again uh, to get rid of this sin nature, to become a new creature. And therefore, Teshuva leads to Kaporet, to atonement. Teshuva leads to atonement. It, the first day of these 40 days begins the period of Teshuva, and the last day is the day of atonement. That is the goal. And of course, we know that this is um, possible in Jesus Christ. Now, in Matthew uh, 4, verse 17, we read the first word words that Jesus spoke when he began his earthly ministry. So you go to other Gospels, you see there are other uh, things when he was uh, 12 years and uh, when he, later when he got baptized. But when he began his ministry, when he began to preach, the very first word he says is repent. This is the first and most important thing, repent. And then he continues, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And uh, I looked this up in the complete Jewish Bible, and there it doesn't use the word repent, 
but it is more uh, uh, described. It says, turn from your sins to God, for the kingdom is near. And that's exactly what it is. That is what the shuva is, to turn around. And so you turn away from your sins towards God. And uh, when you turn around, you always turn away from something and towards something else. There is this change of direction. Uh, your direction of motion changes. Your target changes. That what you face, where you're going to, becomes different. Uh, you move away from your sins, from your old life, and you move towards God. And God is waiting with gladness. I had to think of this, um, uh, this father of the prodigal son. After the prodigal son turned back, eh, Teshuvah, he turned back to his father's house, away from his sins, away from his worldly life. His father was waiting with open arms and uh, was happy and there was a celebration. Um, and, and so it is with our Heavenly Father. He's waiting. This is why, um, why he calls us to turn around. So it's a direction, a redirection of a person's destiny, teshuva. And it always begins with a decision. And it results in action. You decide where you want to go, and then you move. If you only decide and you don't move, the result is zero, obviously. So you make a decision, and then you turn that decision into action. The decision must be firm and absolute. Uh, one thing that God doesn't want, and we have abundant examples in Scripture, is that you look back and flirt with the old life. This is what Satan tries to, to bring about. He will always bring temptations on your path to remind you of these former um, things with which he gave you, quote-unquote, pleasure. He wants to, to draw you back. God does not want that. He wants you to stay with your decision. Uh, when the Israelites uh, left um, Egypt, uh, God told them explicitly to never return there. And um, he also made it very clear. He let them pass through the sea, which was a physical boundary that normally they could not have passed um, uh, yeah, by foot. <laughs> And uh, in this sea, he also crushed the Egyptians, the enemy. So it was a very clear uh, picture that this was now a closed chapter, never to go back to. All things have passed, new things have come. And of course, there were later Israelites that did go back. For example, at the beginning of the Babylonian captivity, there were those that fled back to Egypt and they, they died of the sword. It was. Uh, did not please God at all. Um, then in Luke uh, 17, verse 32, Jesus says, uh, remember Lot's wife. This is another example. Um, she was looking back and it became fatal. She had made a decision to leave Sodom, which she made reluctantly, it was not wholeheartedly, but she made a decision in the end. And the decision was also turned into action because she actually moved, although she had to be dragged out. But nevertheless, she was running away. So these two steps were good. Decision, motion. But then there was looking back. The decision apparently was not genuine. It was not with her heart, not wholeheartedly, as I said. And Actually, she had left her heart in Sodom, and so she looked back to the place where she had left her heart, and um, that became fatal. And when we speak about fatal, we speak about the eternal destiny, because that is what is at stake. And when Jesus called people to follow him, there was a man who said, uh, I will follow you, but first let me go home to say goodbye to, uh, to my family. And uh, Jesus' response was, uh, no one who puts his hands on the plow and keeps looking back is worthy of the kingdom of God. He just doesn't want us to look back, to flirt with the past, to 
stay attached with the old. We have to move and we have to move forward. A decision that is not um, followed, followed through, um, makes, puts a man in a worse place than he, where he was before. Uh, in, uh, in Second Peter uh, 2, verse 22, it is made uh, very uh, graphic. I will only read this verse, but the whole context is exactly what we are talking about. Second um, Peter 2. Verse 22. Um, but it has happened to them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the sow, the, the pig that was washed, to her wallowing in the mire, in the dirt. So uh, it's worse than before. And of course he's quoting here from Proverbs 26, verse 11. So... We consider ourselves as Christians, uh, disciples of Christ, and um, so we are called to be a disciple. Now, what was the first thing when Jesus called his disciples, uh, as we can read in scripture, um, in, in Matthew 4, verse 19, the very first thing he says is follow, follow me. The word follow is there. So the question uh, that you could ask yourself, yeah, follow to where? Where are you going? <laughs> uh, that would be our uh, natural response. If someone says, follow me, you want to know where are you going? Well, uh, he didn't say that, and, and neither did the disciples ask that. Um, and neither do we need to, to ask. He knows where we are going or where he wants you to go. Uh, one thing is for sure, when you follow him, you will walk in the direction that he is going. And that's the whole point. That means you have to change course. Because before you were following him, you are 100% sure not going in the direction where he's going. Naturally, we are always going in the wrong direction. So we have to change course in order to follow Jesus. We cannot continue on the path that we are on. We have to make a change. When Jesus says, follow me, he says the same as repent, as teshuva, turn around. It is the very same thing. So what was the response of his disciples? That's where we can learn something. Uh, in verse 20, uh, it says, as a response on Jesus' call, follow me. And they straightway left their nets and followed him, or right away. Right away they left their nets and they followed him. Or in verse 22, it says, And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Immediately, they left and followed. Two times you read here, they left and followed. These are two things. You leave the one thing and you follow the other. You have to uh, abandon the old path and go on the path on your walk with Christ. Um, always there is... Uh, uh, departure from the old and then going towards the new. In Luke uh, 5 verse 11 it's um, you see the same thing but it's worded a bit uh, more strong maybe. Uh, Luke 5 verse 11 uh, second half they forsook all and followed him. Or another translation would say they left everything behind. They forsook all they left everything behind. Um, and that is the whole point. Leave everything behind and follow him. There are always two sides. The old and the new. Which means there are costs to be paid. You have to give up something. Um, and that is, that is the whole point uh, why uh, Lot's wife looked back. Um, she was not willing to give up the old. Uh, and it just doesn't go. That's what uh, the Israelites uh, said when they were in the desert. Uh, we better, should better have stayed in Egypt. Uh, we better return. Um, it doesn't go. You either go forward towards uh, uh, the kingdom of God or, or you're lost. Um, there are costs. And if we go to uh, Mark 10, verse 28... We see that um, 
I think it's Peter, who, who recognizes this and um, yeah, that's, that they had actually given up their whole life in order to follow Jesus. Uh, they had abandoned everything and so um, he says then uh, to Jesus, uh, verse 28, Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and we have followed thee. That is what they had done. They had given up everything to follow Jesus. A big price, certainly from a worldly perspective. But what is uh, the reward? Jesus answers, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that had left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, and the Gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. Which means in this current life you will already receive a hundredfold, but it will come with persecutions. But even better, in the world to come, eternal life. So there is a reward already now in this present world, although it will come with persecutions, it will not always be easy, um, and there will be eternal life uh, hereafter. So yes, there are costs, but they do not weigh up to the reward. So, the call is to repent. The call is for teshuva. And this, this time, these 40 days, are uh, days that we reflect on this. That we look at ourselves in the mirror, that we see where are we. Um, and will I indeed be... Um, on the right side, uh, at the end of these 40 days. Now, it's not a matter of 40 days, this is just symbolic. Uh, you have to actually be sure today. Uh, how do you repent? How do you turn around practically? I mean, um, okay, for, uh, for Lot it was, uh, it was very clear. You have to leave the city as fast as possible. For the Israelites it was also clear. Um, follow um, follow the Lord uh, who used Moses to lead them and the sea opened and they could see where they had to go but uh, for us it's not always so clear how, how do I follow him what do I change in my life what, what do I need to do and so there are four steps that um, we can um, we can look at that, to make it practical and for the first one uh, I want to go to Proverbs uh, 28 verse 13 the first step namely is to forsake sin it's actually very obvious but uh, nevertheless uh, it says in uh, Proverbs 28 verse 13 he that covereth his sins shall not prosper but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy so you confess them Confess means before the Lord, not to a priest or something. Uh, you confess them and, um, and you forsake them. And we see here, this, this was symbolized um, in, in what the disciples they did. When Jesus said, follow me, they forsook everything and followed him. And, and this is what we must do. Um, so forsake sin is the first step. And... Um, we need, of course, to test to see whether we, we really did so, because sometimes we fool ourselves, and, and Satan is ready to help us to, to do so, and we think we have left it behind, but actually we haven't. Um, that's the example of Lot's wife. It looked like she was leaving everything behind, but she, she hadn't. Her heart was still back there in Sodom. So, how is it demonstrated? Um, some, some things can be very obvious, because uh, they are outward things, but most of the, the sins actually they are inside of us, inside of our heart, and so it's not visible on the outside. Uh, and that's why it says here, he that covereth his sins, they can easily be covered, they can stay hidden for a long time. Not to God, but to yourself and, and to others. Um, it is demonstrated when the same temptation comes on your path, 
the same temptation as you had before under the same conditions, but now you, um, you resist them. There you see the difference. Before you would give in, now you resist. Uh, that is how it's demonstrated. And you cannot fool yourself in, in that. You know when, when it is so. Atonement, that is at the end of the 40 days, the day, the day of atonement. Atonement will not happen without repentance. So this teshuva has to happen first. Otherwise there cannot be atonement. There cannot be salvation. If the repentance is true, if it is genuine, then you will begin to hate the sin. Because you know it, it destroys you and it actually leads to death. So forsaking sin is the first step. The second one is that you have to regret the breach in your relationship with God. That is namely what sin does. It separates you from God. And many people uh, are seeking God. Uh, and sometimes they don't even know who this God is. They don't know about the Bible, and about Jesus, but they are seeking something. They know there is something that they need to seek. Uh, they will not find it. Um, but we have this built-in uh, desire to have a relationship with our Creator. And um, so we are very blessed that we have, um, we have the truth in Jesus. But you have to regret this breach in the, in the relationship with God. If, you don't, if you're not sorry for this, if you do not desire um, to restore this, to have it restored, then, uh, yeah, you will not uh, pursue it. And um, one of the best examples I can think of is uh, Psalm 51, Psalm of David, where um, he, after he had, um, uh, he had slept with um, uh, Bathsheba, is her name, yeah? I have to think. Um, he was, he was, um, Tormented with this this um, this pain to be separated from God, this he felt in, in even in his bones, as he sa says, he felt that um, he was separated from God through this sin. And uh, he says, "There have mercy upon me, O God, according to Thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of Thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions." And this is a year later. A year he has had sleepless nights, he has been in pain of this. He says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. Here is the confession. I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. See, he waited a year. He was, had sleepless nights, he was restless, he was unhappy. He thought it might go away, but it, no, it doesn't. You can struggle your whole lifetime, it doesn't go away. Against thee, thee only have I sinned. This is what we must recognize. The sins are not against people, it's not against anything, but against God only. And he says then, I, uh, against thee I have done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest. God's um, judgment is just. He is justified because of our sins. And then he continues, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I, he says, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. He recognizes also that he has a sin nature like we all do. We are born in sin, therefore we must be born again. Um, okay, and he continues then, um, to ask to be cleansed. And it's of course interesting that he says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean, wash me and I shall be whiter uh, than snow. Uh, hyssop is red, it points to the blood of Christ. That will make you white as snow, that will clean you. So, this is uh, the, the, the regret that we must feel. And so, if you look at the meaning of the English word repentance, there is this, this great remorse, this great regret. This is what we must feel um, as, a, uh, as a result of our sins. This separation of God must make us feel sorry. So, 
the first step is forsake sin, but the step and second thing, and of course they go all together, is to regret this breach with God. If there's no true remorse, then uh, you might forsake sin, but it will only last uh, so long, and you will return, because you don't really feel sorry, actually, for what you did. The third thing, and we've touched on this, is to confess the truth and to make things right. Now, conf this uh, has been, of course, uh, mis been misused by uh, certain religions, that confession is to a priest or something of that nature. That is not what the scripture tells us. Confession is before God. It is what we just read from Psalm 51, what um, David does. Uh, uh, he confesses his sins to God. Um, Confession is, um, is actually a key thing that we speak out before God what we did wrong to him and that we are sorry for this uh, and not to try to, uh, to avoid this. Um, he's willing to forgive if we for, uh, confess. In 1 John uh, 1, verse 9, this is um, stated. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it begins with if. It's a condition. If we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We must bring them before him. Now, there might people, uh, be people that say yes, but... Uh, we must confess them, and not only to God, also to people. Uh, that is not a condition for forgiveness, but it, is, um, it can be very, very helpful. Because it's not always, uh, or most of the times, it's not a, a, a simple decision. Ah, I will now stop uh, sinning and uh, I'm on my way with the Lord. It's not that simple. Um, it's often a struggle. And um, it's, 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 in any case, it's a spiritual battle. And when you go to battle and you're all alone, you don't stand much chance. You need an army. And so uh, it can be very helpful to have uh, brothers and sisters pray for you. Uh, and um, that is what is uh, meant, the, the context in James uh, chapter 5, verse 16. And so again, this, uh, this is used by uh, religions to, uh, to defend confession to priests, but it's not what it's about. It is, the context here is the power of prayer. And so it says in verse 16, Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So that can absolutely... Um, make all the difference that others are praying for you uh, but they can only pray for you if they know of course what to pray for so you have to confess um, to them um, unlike uh, 1st John 1 verse 9 it does not say if you do this then you will receive forgiveness it's not what it says so it's not a condition but it is certainly uh, helpful and uh, in, in many cases necessary and another thing that we uh, have is when, um, when we live away from God, we cause a lot of damage uh, around us, not only in our own life, but also in the lives of others. And so, uh, together with confession, the, uh, especially confession to, to other people, there is also sometimes the necessity to make a right. It is part of, um, of us showing and demonstrating that we have indeed turned away from, um, from the old. Um, and so we see that in um, Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24, because if we say that we, we've turned away from, uh, from our sins, but um, we do not uh, fix certain things that we have uh, caused, as if they are um, unimportant to us, we are indifferent to them, then actually... We show something else than what we, cons than what we um, testify of. So it says there, um, Therefore, if thou bring any gift to the altar, and thou rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. 
first be reconciled to thy brother, then come and offer thy gift. If you have unfinished business, damage that you have caused, uh, disputes that you have not settled, uh, God says go and fix this first, do this, before um, you come uh, to the altar. So confess, confession and uh, making right is also part of the process. Yeah, we have to do this with caution. Sometimes making right, so you can go too far in making things right because not everyone is, is waiting for, for you to come back to them and uh, uh, quote unquote fix things. Sometimes you uh, rip open old wounds and make things worse. So it needs uh, some discernment and wisdom, of course. But God will show. So we have forsaking sin, regretting the breach uh, between you and God, confessing the truth and making things right. And the fourth thing is uh, not unimportant. It is to accept your forgiveness. Uh, we just read, if you uh, confess your sins, God is faithful and true to forgive. But we have to accept it. In many cases, people do all these things. But they don't accept to be forgiven. They still stay in this, oh, I'm so bad and everything is so uh, miserable and uh, I'm good for nothing. And of course, again, the enemy is ready to fuel this uh, feeling. Uh, then you're still nowhere. You haven't reached uh, anything. So you have to accept this forgiveness in order to be able to continue with God. Um, Philippians uh, 3, verse 13 Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is Paul writing, obviously he had uh, quite a history of persecuting Christians, uh, having them uh, even sentenced to death. He had a lot to feel very bad about and um, depressed about. But he says, no, I, I have to forget the things which are behind because I brought them for the Lord. He has forgiven me. Now I can forget. And what can I do? I, um, I reach forth unto the things which are before me. You cannot go forward if you are looking back. You will uh, hit a wall or, or fall. So we have to accept uh, also that God uh, has forgiven and he made this possible through his son Jesus Christ, of course. And then we can move forward. Uh, Psalm 32, verse 5. Again, this is uh, King David. And in this verse, actually, you find everything. I acknowledge my sin unto thee. So this is the confession. And my iniquity have I not hid. Nothing hidden confessed everything. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. That's past tense. God has forgiven and he has accepted it. And then you will see that uh, he, is, he is ready to continue with the Lord. Um, this is um, a beautiful promise and security that we have. Again, uh, 1 John 1, uh, verse 9, if we confess, he is willing to forgive. And it's, it's a great promise. And we can uh, be uh, secure in that. And it's always the enemy who will bring doubts, who will, say, uh, who will bring thoughts and temptations and say, ah, you, you can't do it. Uh, you're not worthy. Uh, look, at, uh, look at you. God will uh, not accept you, etc., etc., all these things. But this is not... Um, not what God uh, has promised us. In Isaiah, we find a similar thing. Isaiah 43, verse 1. We see in, uh, in Isaiah, of course, uh, as with other prophets, this um, God continuously calling out to Israel, why have you left me? Uh, don't you remember? I was the one who led you out of the land of Egypt. And uh, he is then... Um, confronting them with their own sins, with their uh, rebellion. Um, and he was also showing his mercy. 
And he says there, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. So here is his mercy. He has forgiven. And then in uh, verse uh, 18, he, um, he, he confirms this. He says, Remember you not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. That's exactly the song that we sang before. He will make a way where there seems to be no way. But this is what he promises. He doesn't only say, I have redeemed thee. He says, forget about the things from before. In other words, hey, I have forgotten them. They, they are away. They are blotted out. Consider... Um, no longer the things of old. There will be new thing, totally new things that you could not even imagine. Rivers in the desert, and that is how radical he he will change uh, your life when this teshuva, this repentance, is sincere. Uh, things will happen that that we can't even imagine. Who can imagine a river in the desert? But God can do it. However, if we do not accept this forgiveness, if we stay wallowing in, in this feeling of um, being not able, um, then um, yeah, we stay where we are. We can't move. We may say that we have forsaken sin. We may regret the breach. We may confess it. But uh, we have to also accept the promise that God gave us. Now repentance, the shuva, is a lifestyle, I would say. It's not a one-time decision. And it, it comes out from these things, of course. It's not a one-time event. Um, in our weakness, we will often stumble and fall. But as long as we keep looking forward, in other words, keep following him, then um, he will pick us up and uh, he will be graceful and not um, um, abandon us for our mistakes, but uh, he, will, um, he will restore us time and again. As long as we keep leaning on, on him. So this month of uh, Elul is set apart for Teshuva for repentance in preparation of, of Rosh Hashanah, or rather uh, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, and then followed by Yom Kippur. It's, it's symbols that, that uh, put our focus back on why we are here. We are here in this life to uh, have this relation with God restored, to um, be adapted, uh, adopted into his family, uh, and on our way to his kingdom. We, we are part of his kingdom right now, but um, when we uh, leave this life, we will be fully redeemed into it. So, uh, on, the, on the calendar, we, were, we are somewhere in between this, uh, this beginning of these 40 days and the end. And so, the question is also, where are we in, in spiritually? Are we also somewhere halfway, or are we resting secured in Jesus that we uh, we are forgiven do we walk with him or um, are we somewhere in the in the process um, that's what we reflect on especially we looked at the first word that Jesus uh, said when he began his ministry it's repent it's teshuva and, and the word repent or repentance is uh, almost a taboo word in the in the modern church, people don't like to talk about this. They rather talk about uh, praising and hallelujah, and which is also good. But um, this is the reality, of course. We have to look in the mirror and see um, who we are. So we look also at the last words that Jesus speaks. And uh, they are at the very end of uh, our Bible in Revelation 22, verse uh, 20. 
And uh, he repeats, by the way, these same words three times in this chapter. Um, the last, uh, here in uh, verse 20, he says, Surely I come quickly. And again, he, it's a surely. It's uh, not uh, a maybe. He will come quickly. Um, so there is also a, a sense of urgency in the whole process. It's... Um, not something we can uh, postpone for later times or others think well when I see death coming then I will uh, turn to the Lord well you might not see it coming um, he will come quickly and that's uh, that's wonderful but if things need to be uh, fixed if the, the shuva is not uh, has not happened then um, it calls for urgency that's why the trumpet is blowing and throughout this whole 40 days there is one verse that is uh, echoed um, and, and uh, I put it also uh, therefore in the timeline um, for which I will put the download link and it is from Isaiah 55 uh, verse 6 uh, it's really something we should take at heart uh, not to think of repentance as uh, concept or a process that we can maybe philosophize about, think about and uh, ponder on, it's, it, it calls to action. It's very much like uh, in Lot's days, the angel said, we have to leave now. Yeah, and, and Lot and his uh, family, they were, uh, they were hesitating, they had to be pulled out. That is what this word, this verse also calls for. It says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found call you upon him while he is near. This implies that there may be a time that it, he cannot be found anymore, that it is too late. Uh, and again, uh, this, this is made clear by Jesus' own words when he says, surely I come quickly. So let's listen to that uh, trumpet, that wake-up call, and uh, get ready.